Okay, this is our November rendition of What's in Bloom at the Ruth Bancroft Garden. So we're starting off with uh, a daisy that we've had on here before. This is Balea multiradiata from the southwest United States and southward into Mexico. So it's one of the desert daisies and we like it for its uh, pale uh, bluish foliage as well as its bright yellow flowers. It has a long blooming season. Really the weakness of this plant is that eventually it gets uh, dead patches in it and gets leggy and doesn't look so neat. But fortunately it reseeds and so we just take out the uh, ones that are overgrown and, and start again with, with younger ones. But it really does bloom over a long period of time all summer long and into the fall. We have a native California plant called woolly blue curls, Trichostema linatum and has wonderful blue flowers with uh, curling stamens and uh, pistil and uh, that's what gives it its name but it's a little bit fussy as a horticultural subject so it's been crossed with a mexican species uh, which is trichostema propusii to yield this plant uh, midnight magic and uh, it has the beautiful purple flowers like the uh, california native one does but they're a little bit smaller and the uh, bush is a little bit uh, neater and, and easier to uh, keep going. And it does flower on and on and on all summer long and into the fall. This is a special treat for us, an agave that we have not had bloom at the garden before. And uh, it's called agave dazzlerioides, uh, meaning agave that looks like a dazzlerian. Well, it's a little bit small for a dazzlerian and its leaves are a little wide, but it does give the general impression of a dazzlerian. Uh, this is a plant that comes from the little town of Tepoztlan between Mexico City and Cuernavaca. And uh, it grows on cliffs, really big sheer cliffs. And uh, in habitat, there it is perched on the cliff with the inflorescence arching out and then dangling down over the precipice. And that's just what it's doing here, arching out and then dangling down. It's not quite open yet. It's still at the bud stage, uh, but the uh, effect of the emerging inflorescence is quite dramatic. And it is on the small side for an agave, not a telephone pole size inflorescence, uh, but one that's uh, more modest size and very interesting. The buds are greenish and the uh, bracts are uh, purple tinged. Uh, when the flowers open up, they will become more pale and a, and a pale yellow color, but we're not quite there yet. This shrub is called Caledia paradoxa, or the anchor plant. And the anchor plant is because it has these uh, stiff uh, stem segments that uh, come to a point and look like anchor points. Uh, it comes from South America, from Uruguay and Southern Brazil. And it's a very spiny plant. It's really not a plant you'd want right next to the path because it's very pokey. Uh, but it has beautiful little white flowers, many, many of them. They're tiny, but fragrant, sort of, sort of a vanilla-like fragrance. Uh, it's a, um, a modest-sized shrub and easy to grow, very tolerant of uh, different soil conditions, never has trouble even in cold winters. Uh, and we uh, don't see it planted in gardens very often, but it is a very interesting plant and we're pleased to have it here at the Ruth Bancroft Garden. A lot of the aloes that we grow here in California come from South Africa, uh, which has many species that have some degree of cold tolerance and consequently uh, succeed for us here in California. But at the northern end of aloes range, uh, they extend up from Africa into the Arabian Peninsula. And this is aloe rubra violacea, which is one of the Arabian species. The name rubra violacea means red violet, and it doesn't refer to the flowers, which are more of a uh, coral red color, but to the leaves, which take on purplish tinges uh, in a sunny position. Uh, this plant has been here for many years, uh, for decades, and has turned into a big clump over time, but it's very slow to offset and to increase like that. Uh, it puts on a wonderful display for us in uh, November and December, so the flowers are just beginning now and will continue on for the next couple of months. This desert shrub is named Justicia Californica, and it comes from uh, both California and Arizona. And uh, this yellow form is known as Tecate Gold, but there are also uh, orange or coral or red forms as well. Uh, it has a long flowering season, narrow yellow flowers that uh, flare into two at the mouth, and it's attractive to hummingbirds. 
Okay, Euphorbia is a very uh, large genus and very variable, but there is one particular group, uh, mainly from South Africa, that are called the medusoid euphorbias. And this is because they have a central head and then radiating cylindrical arms that uh, remind one of Medusa and her head of snakes. Uh, these are uh, rather small plants. You can see this plant, even after a decade, uh, is only a few inches wide. But they are quite wonderful in terms of their textures and their uh, wonderful little flowers. The uh, flower has a little bit of red, a little bit of green in it, uh, but it's quite tiny and you need to look up close in order to see that. Uh, these plants have some cold tolerance, but they really don't like a lot of wet in the winter, so we have a lot of drainage in the soil to uh, keep it from getting too much moisture in the winter time. Uh, this is a, a hybrid, but likely it has Euphorbia gorgonus in it because it resembles that species with its stubby little arms. This is a species of eucalyptus called Eucalyptus polyanthemos. It's known as the silver dollar gum, and that's because the juvenile leaves are very different from the mature leaves. So here at the mature stage, the leaf is bluish and pointed, but at the juvenile stage, they're round and white, and so uh, hence the name. Uh, they have very tiny little white flowers, but many, many of them, and they flower in the fall and the winter time. This does eventually get to be a big tree, but oftentimes it's grown for the production of the leaves for florists, and in that case, they just keep on cutting it down and cutting it down and cutting it down so that it will get new juvenile foliage, and they'll have an endless supply for the florists. There are many species of aloe in the garden that bloom in the wintertime, but this one is aloe fosteri from northeastern South Africa, and it flowers in the fall every year. Uh, the inflorescence is pretty tall compared to the size of the rosette, uh, almost as tall as I am, uh, and this belongs to a group called the maculate aloes. Maculate means spotted, and yes, they do generally have spotted leaves, but so do many other aloes. What characterizes this particular group is uh, generally stemless rosette and flowers that have a swelling at the base. So uh, that is uh, something you don't see in most other aloes. The tubular flowers are typical of aloes, but that swollen base is a giveaway. Various agave species are found in the southwestern United States, all throughout Mexico and all through Central America and down as far as northern South America. But Mexico has the most number of species, including this one, agave potatorum, which comes from Puebla and Oaxaca. Uh, in southern Mexico. So uh, as you can see, the leaves on this plant are already withering as it flowers. So agaves are monocarpic. That means they only flower and set seed once at the end of their lives, and then that's it. Now in a case like this, it has no offsets, and so the, that will be it. The plant will be done after it finishes flowering. In many other cases, agaves make offsets, and then there's more to keep going after the mother plant dies. So this means we'll have to start over again from seed with this plant because uh, now that it's coming into flower, uh, once it sets seed, that'll be the end of it. Uh, the inflorescence, as with many agaves, is quite tall with little clusters of flowers. That means it's in subgenus agave. They have floral branches with clusters of flowers at the end of each branch, as opposed to just a spike of flowers like the uh, plants in subgenus Latea have. Uh, agave potatorum is much used in Oaxaca to make mezcal. Uh, there are various species used to make mezcal in different parts of Mexico, but this one's very popular in Oaxaca. We've seen an aloe from uh, South Africa and one from Arabia. Uh, here is a species from Ethiopia. We don't have too many species from Ethiopia in the garden. So this is Aloe shelpii, and it too is a fall bloomer. November is it's usually its peak month, and it has uh, leaves with uh, reddish margins and teeth along the margins, and then a uh, blue-green leaf that gets purple flushes and bright sun. Uh, it's a short aloe, never gets uh, much of a stem to it, and uh, over the years it's turned into quite a good-sized clump. It is very remarkable that it succeeds here because Ethiopia is not so far north from the equator, uh, but this plant has done very well for us over the years. 
Uh, mangave is a cross between a manfrida and an agave. Uh, manfrida and agave are very closely related to each other, but agaves have stiff fibrous leaves and man, uh, manfridas have softer flexible leaves that sometimes are even deciduous. But manfridas have one trait that agaves never have and that's purple spots. So uh, the goal of many of these uh, mangave crosses is to get a plant that, that has an agave-like form but with the purple spots from the manfrida. And that's true of this one here, mangave blood spot. Uh, one of the first of the mangaves to come uh, into horticulture. Uh, the flowers on Manfredas are generally not all that colorful. Uh, they're nice close up. The, uh, the yellow pollen and the uh, greenish to pale yellow flowers, uh, but they are, aren't really showy from a distance. It's more the rosette that people grow a Manfreda, uh, uh, a mangave for rather than the flowers. The Protea family is a very interesting family and uh, many members come from South Africa such as the Proteas. You probably have seen those in uh, florists. Uh, but Australia also has many plants in the family including those in the genus Hockia. Uh, and this is Hockia verrucosa from Western Australia. Uh, a lot of the plants from Western Australia do well here because they have a climate similar to ours with summers that are dry and rainfall in the winter time and that makes them uh, apt to do well in California where we have the same type of a, of a rainfall pattern. Uh, Hockia varicosa uh, flowers in uh, November and December so it's uh, just getting going flowering now and the flowers are pink and white and rather small clusters of them but many flowers and uh, really quite wonderful close up. The foliage is kind of reminiscent of a rosemary. Uh, the bush is an attractive bush all year round and it's like icing on the cake when it comes into flower. We very much appreciate opuntias in our garden uh, because they uh, provide color for us in the springtime with their flowers and then again in the fall with their fruits. This one is one of the large growing opuntias, opuntia tomentosa. Now the name tomentosa means hairy and that's because the pads have a velvety uh, short hair on them that makes them uh, feel fuzzy to the touch. And uh, this plant has been here for a long time. You can see it's developed a good sized trunk over time. And it flowers a great deal, it has orange flowers in the springtime. And then what follows is this array of fruits in the fall that are uh, red. And the fruits also are velvety to the touch like the pads are. Opuntia tomentosa from central Mexico. Plants in the genus Ferrocactus are oftentimes referred to as barrel cacti because they have this barrel shape like you see here with Ferrocactus potsii. Uh, Ferrocactus potsii is a summer blooming species so it had uh, large yellow flowers with a red center during the summertime but it has these wonderful fruits that almost look like little pineapples and those are very long lasting so they will last all the way until next year's flowering and uh, you can see there's really quite a lot of fruits on the top of that plant. This particular plant is actually a world famous plant because a photograph of it illustrates the species in the book Ferrocactus which was published by the British Cactus and Succulent Society. So uh, this particular plant has been seen by people who read that book all around the world. Uh, it's gotten uh, larger over time and uh, stayed single the whole time as they usually do. Uh, once in a while you have a plant that will divide at the head and become two-headed, but uh, usually they are solitary like this plant, Ferrocactus potsii. Among the many kinds of opuntias or prickly pears is this interesting plant from northeastern Mexico called Opuntia gomii and it's a cultivar called Old Mexico and, and this differs from other Opuntias in having a wavy undulating margin on the pad rather than a smooth edge like most Opuntia pads have. Now uh, this pad is actually a flattened stem segment and it's oftentimes mistaken for a, a leaf but don't know better. Uh, but it is not. It's a stem segment. Uh, the flowers come in the springtime and then they're followed in the fall by these purple fruits that are club shaped and uh, juicy and delicious on the inside. So this is the biggest 
cluster of flowers that this plant has ever made and now followed by the biggest cluster of fruits ever made on the plant and we can't believe that there are so many all together on that one pad we don't know what was different about that one pad that made so many flowers come out there but that's just what it did opuntia gomii old mexico when people think of an uh, agave or a century plant, they usually think of agave americana, which is a huge plant with a telephone pole sized inflorescence. But this is one of the smaller species. This is agave microceps, which comes from Sinaloa on the west coast of Mexico. So there is a full size rosette in flower and uh, they only grow up until they flower and then they die afterwards. So that's the end of the line for this rosette, but it does have offsets and those will keep going after the mother plant is done. So the flowers have these uh, sort of grayish mauve buds and then when they actually open then you get the yellow from the stamens and uh, a little bit of purple from the filaments and so there's more color going on in the lower part of the inflorescence where the flowers are actually open. Uh, because it comes from uh, as far south as it does in Sinaloa and not too far inland, this plant does not get any cold to speak of in the winter time. So we're really surprised that it's able to take temperatures down to the upper 20s in cultivation. Uh, not common in cultivation as yet, but a wonderful little dwarf species of agave, agave microceps. Ruth was always fond of yellow flowered aloes and I like yellow aloes too, so I uh, tried to hybridize yellow aloes that would come into bloom at different times of the year. So this one here is aloe castellorum from Arabia crossed with aloe laborana from Uganda. And uh, I really liked the way the leaves came out with this uh, wonderful um, sort of orangey tinge to them and then the bright yellow flowers uh, contrasting with that. And it consistently blooms in the fall. Aloe castellorum laborana. Another place that has interesting aloes is Madagascar. So uh, Madagascar is in the Indian Ocean off the eastern coast of South Africa and it's a little bit tropical there so not very many of the aloes from Madagascar have cold tolerance. This one here is aloe de vericata which is a, actually a common plant in the southwest of Madagascar. It's quite arid there and the plants can grow actually taller than me uh, in, in habitat. But this young plant with three heads is only a couple of feet tall, uh, but it has been flowering now for some time. This was the first inflorescence it made this year, and it's now in seed. And this is the second inflorescence reaching the end. And now here's the third one coming out uh, that's just beginning to flower now. So that means it's been in flower now for about three months. So that's a good long spell. Now, aloe de vericata and habitat oftentimes gets quite purple tinged, uh, but we don't quite have enough uh, sun here for it to turn that color. But the blue-green leaves with uh, purplish teeth on the edge are still quite attractive. Uh, we don't know whether this plant will get to be really tall in time like they do in habitat or not, but we're willing to take the time and see what happens. Aloe de vericata. Grevillea is another large genus in the Protea family from Australia. And hybridizers have been really been working on uh, grevilleas a lot, and a lot of new cultivars have been coming online in recent years, including this one, which is called Grevillea King's Fire. And that's named after King's Park near Perth in Western Australia. And uh, we really are very happy with this plant because it never stops blooming. It's been blooming uh, all year long, and here it is uh, November and still going strong with new buds coming out and flowers that are open and it's very attractive to bees as well. You uh, don't have to watch the plant for very long on a sunny day before you see all the bees coming in to visit the flowers. Uh, a plant that has nice, fine uh, textured foliage and is ever blooming is a great plant for the garden and we're really pleased with this one. Okay. Senecio is a very large genus in the daisy family and some plants in Senecio are succulent like this one uh, and others are not. Uh, they, uh, I think you can see when you look at the flower closely that it is like a small daisy type of a flower. Uh, and this one is from Madagascar. So uh, there are a number of species of Senecio from Madagascar, although many others come from elsewhere. And uh, this one has uh, smooth, waxy leaves 
and, uh, and then a profusion of yellow flowers in the fall, and it's just getting going now. Uh, the height of this is about uh, four feet tall, so it's gotten to be a good-sized bush over time. And we're kind of surprised that it's done well for us, because coming from Madagascar, we weren't sure about its, its cold tolerance. That was our uh, November edition of What's in Bloom at the Ruth Bancroft Garden. Uh, note that we only put things on What's in Bloom that are in bloom for an entire month, or at least most of one. But there are many other things that have shorter flower spans uh, and, th and that never appear on What's in Bloom. So we encourage you to come to the garden and see for yourself. There's always something interesting in bloom, always something interesting going on at the Ruth Bancroft Garden. And you can visit our website anytime, ruthbancroftgarden.org. And we have lots of so social media postings of uh, things that come into flower and so on for you to check out on our website as well.